Hi, I am Dr. Sridhar. Welcome to my channel. I hope you have subscribed and do share uh, any interesting videos you find. I request you to go through the previous videos and uh, benefit from the playlists that are organized both for parents and for medical team. So G6 period deficiency is a very important topic. Uh, you can refer my uh, talks on neonatal jaundice, especially the uh, American Academy guidelines update in 2022. And G6 PD deficiency is one of the most important factors that causes a sudden increase in jaundice and very rarely we may end up in problems related to that because the rise is not predicted by the normal nomograms. So G6PD or glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme is present in the red blood cells. The main role is to protect the red blood cells from damage from oxidant chemicals which are present in certain foods as well as in medications. So it acts through the NADPH pathway and it's very important to protect the red blood cell from destruction from oxidant chemicals. When there is inherited deficiency of this enzyme, it's called G6PD deficiency and typically it's X-linked inheritance, X-linked recessive inheritance. Mother is usually the carrier, boys are affected clinically and girls can be carriers and are rarely affected the girl babies. It's frequent in certain regions of the world including the Middle East uh, which is a Mediterranean type, Africa, China, North India and so on and the reason it pro protected in certain populations is a protective effect against malaria and this flourished by gene selection, same as many hemoglobinopathies. A quick recap of how X-linked recessive inheritance works. So you have the uh, affected father, which is a rare scenario, and uh, unaffected mother. The uh, X chromosome from the father goes to the girl, so she becomes a carrier and she has a normal X chromosome from the mother as well, so that's why she's a carrier. The son doesn't get the X chromosome from the father, he only gets X from the mother and the Y from the father, so the son is not affected. In the more common scenario is where the unaffected mother is a carrier, the father is uh, normal and then the a girl gets uh, the carrier state from the mother 50% of the time and the boy gets the disease state because the X chromosome that comes is the only one and it's affected in 50%. So the 50% here is 50% of boys will get uh, the deficiency or the disease and 50% of the girls will be carriers. So here you can see it's not exactly 50% of the disease but it's in that particular gender and each pregnancy obviously has a 50% chance of either being a boy or a girl so uh, you have to calculate accordingly. There are different subtypes of uh, G6PD deficiency. We can call them classes and it can be class 1 to 5. Class 1 is the most severe and not very common. The enzyme level is less than 10% of the normal activity. Class 2 is the one that is common in the Middle East and favism is very common with this picture. It can be moderate to severe, uh, so depending on the proportion of enzyme activity, less than 10% is severe, between 10 to 40% is moderate. Uh, class 3 also is a moderate deficiency, it's common in the African ancestry and uh, the triggers are different between the class 2 and class 3 and uh, class 3 is more like intermittent uh, hemolysis or anemia. Class 4 and 5 variants are of no clinical significance, class 5 actually has an increased enzyme activity so uh, we don't pick it up normally. There are severe types will present with neonatal jaundice. Uh, here the jaundice is abrupt but there is uh, antiglobulin test negative. So the Coombs test is negative, it means it's not immune. So it's a non-immune hemolytic anemia and the hemolysis manifestations will be there. So remember that the risk of kernicterus is higher with hemolytic anemia. So we should be very aggressive in the care of these babies and it's important to pick it up. Uh, in moderate deficiency there may be neonatal jaundice but here they may not have hemolysis. Possibly it's related to the Gilbert syndrome like liver conjugation defects uh, and this associated with excess production possibly with the mild hemolysis which is not picked up on the tests results in the high level of jaundice or the persisting level of jaundice. Exposure to the triggering foods and medications uh, which produce hemolysis may be the other manifestation. When there is a sudden trigger the child presents with acute pallor jaundice which is difficult to pick up in an older child you need to specifically look for it in good lighting in the sclera uh, fatigue back pains chills and fever may be there the chills and fever are related to the hemolysis 
The severity is variable and it can be dose dependent according to what you are exposed to. The diagnosis of G6PD deficiency is either made as part of the newborn screening or where the, the acute hemolysis and you are looking for it or unexpected jaundice and it can also be done in high risk groups before we consider using a medication that is high risk like primaquine. So that's not common but of course if you have to use a medication and you want to rule it out you have spot tests for G6PD which can be considered. So the newborn screening for example in the Middle East it's part of the newborn screening it's a qualitative or semi-quantitative most of them are semi-quantitative tests so the repeat test is only needed where there is no family history and it's a borderline test but most of these screening reports advise us to repeat after two to three months with a quantitative test in the lab. Uh, there is a high index of suspicion in neonatal jaundice where the jaundice rises suddenly or the ancestry suggests a risk population even if there is one parent from that population. Uh, the risk of what chemical is inducing it is difficult to elicit especially in newborn jaundice. Uh, vitamin K has been implicated but there is no change in the recommendations for how you give vitamin K even in G6PD deficient babies because the risk of reaction is very low. So can the test be negative in the acute phase? Yes, it can be due to two reasons. Uh, one is the high reticulocyte count in the immediate post hemolysis period because the reticulocytes are younger RBCs and they have a higher level of the enzyme so it may falsely give a normal reading and uh, it may also be because in uh, certain hemolytic conditions where they are exposed to chemicals or foods the relatively older RBCs have a lower G6PD level and they are the ones which are hemolyzed quickly the younger ones survive so the level may relatively look normal so where the index of suspicion is high repeat after three months of the hemolytic episode so this is a proportionately higher level among the present RBC so the ratios will may come in the normal range that's why we need to repeat after the child has been normal for three months so the medications to avoid this has been taken from the up-to-date and it's fairly pragmatic uh, it doesn't give unnecessarily a long list of medicines which have to be avoided it uh, gives a list of likely to be unsafe category where you have to better avoid it or if you need to use it, you do a test before it. So mainly in terms of uh, fluoroquinolones, common antibiotics which are used in older kids and adults. And uh, we have Adapsone if you need to use Primaquin antimalarial and sulfonylurea as anti-diabetic agents and so on. In terms of chemical exposure, fava beans are a high risk food. Most of the other foods like chickpeas, other beans are not implicated much, though some populations may react. Henna can react, naphthalene balls thankfully are not used very often but still in the developing world it's used so we have to be asking for that history and if the parents are traveling to a developing country you need to make sure that they are aware of this risk. So there is a sexual stimulant, the rush which can have uh, isobutyl nitrate, amyl nitrate, these are oxidants as well and they may react to that so it's important in the older uh, adolescents and adults to be aware of this. So these are medications which are in the list in some of the websites but are probably safe. However, if a particular family reacts to it, the tendency may persist. So we may have to ask them if they've used it before or if you see that a child received it and presented with the reaction, it's better to avoid it in future in that family. So paracetamol or acetaminophen and we have antipyrene, vitamin C in high doses. Uh, chloramphenicol. Chloroquine again in the standard doses they don't react if you need to use a high dose for any reason you may have to consider uh, testing. Chlorotrimazole is often used and uh, doesn't seem to react so trimethoprim is also safe if you need to use it for prophylaxis for UTI and uh, phenytoin of course uh, we have to keep that in mind but these drugs can be used unless there is a specific history. In terms of foods to avoid, it's mainly the fava beans and fava beans is a long Mediterranean beans which is often used in foods like fool and falafel which are common favorites vegetarian options here. Uh, falafel from uh, certain countries are made with uh, chickpeas and they can be consumed but the ones from Egypt especially if that uh, recipe is used it will be using uh, uh, fava so you should avoid that. The pregnant mothers uh, who are delivering, they should be advised about avoiding this during breastfeeding as well. If there is a family history till you know the newborn screening report. So the main reason is there are two beta glu glucosides, visin and convisin, which after digestion they are converted to oxidant chemicals which can cause hemolysis. Bitter melon is another product which reacts similar with these uh, compounds. Most other foods are safe. 
but again you have to observe if there is a certain family history of a food triggering hemolysis you have to avoid that in that family and if uh, breastfeeding you have to avoid fava beans during the breastfeeding period in case the baby is positive or deficient so majority are asymptomatic through life and there are no concerns with pregnancies a girl a carrier girl can become pregnant with no problems uh, they can donate blood as well and uh, it's important to educate on the risk factors for the entire family so that everyone is aware not to give that particular uh, component and also the parent should be advised in from any physician encounter that they should inform them of the history uh, so that the medications can be avoided so uh, I hope uh, this summary of G6PD deficiency is useful. In case the child comes with hemolysis, of course the treatment is similar to any acute hemolysis. You may need to remove the trigger first, identify and remove it. Uh, you may have to use uh, transfusion, supportive treatment for the pain, fever and so on and uh, wait for the hemolysis to improve. So uh, thank you so much for uh, listening and do share it. Thank you.